welcome back to another exciting and fact and fun-filled episode of All About the Gear. I am Frederick Van Johnson, and my good friend right here is Mr. Doug Kay. Hey, Doug, what's going on, man? Hey, Frederick, I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing good. I hear you got your hands on one of the latest golden eggs to pop out of the folks down at Sony, right? And that's the A6000 that we're going to be talking about. Right. I do. I do. Cute little toy. It's a, a great camera. I've been using it quite a bit for the last month, and I love it. And not only not only did you get your hands on it, this is not to not to give away the ending to the story, but that is your personal A6000. This wasn't sent as a borrow lenses loaner or from Sony for us to check out. You you punk down you put down some Doug K funds for that, right? That's right. Hard cash. I bought it. I bought it the moment it was announced. I knew this was something I'd want, and I. Uh, again, not to give away everything, but I sold my NEX6 and NEX7 and replaced them with this. Wow. So so is is that little thing a replacement for those? I mean, in the lineup, is it like, okay, those are no, the, the NEXs are antiquated and it's all about the Alpha and the 6000 is the first in that march of Alpha smaller camera bodies? It, it is. I believe the NEX brand, if you will, is pretty much gone. Uh, you can still buy the 5. Uh, but the uh, officially, this replaced the NEX6, which makes sense because they added three zeros to six and came up with 6,000. Yeah. But in fact, it replaces the six and the seven, and I think there's a 5,000 out at the low end. Okay. Well, give us the basics of this thing. What's what's the the price and you know sensor size and all the the nuts and bolts? Yeah, this is a uh, this is sort of a low-end camera, if you will. This is a $600 camera at the street price for the body only. You can spend $750, bucks, another $150, and get a power zoom that I that I don't like. Um, 24 megapixels. This is up because the NEX6 was just a 16 megapixel uh, camera. Um, and... Uh, 7 was 24, though, right? What's that? The NEX7 was 24 megapixels. Yes, that's correct. So this replaces it. And it's not the NEX7 sensor. It's actually an all-new sensor um, that I think is better than the NEX7. So, you know, they're really uh, you know up in their game here. Cool. All right. So APS-C size is the – so it's the, not micro four-thirds, not the full frame of the A7, A7R, A7S uh, bodies, but this is sort of the middle ground between micro four-thirds and full frame, right? Yeah, this is the, the, the middle ground. This is what you get from your less expensive Canons or Nikons. It's a 1.5 crop factor, as we call it, and that's the, you know um, – uh, you know, the 70D, the Nikon 5300, 3300, all those cameras are in the same, roughly the same sensor size as this. Okay. Well, let's talk about the body and the controls. You held it up. You showed it for a minute there. It looks it looks tiny. I mean, it, it looks like a little point and shoot. And it looks like it's definitely in that, in that NEX family. What's different about this body compared to like the NEX6, for example? Well, I wish I had my NEX6 right here to show you, but it's gone. Mm -hmm. Some lucky person has that camera um, and got it very inexpensively, I should say. The camera is small. It is, you know, the same size pretty much as the Olympus um, OMD EM10, which is a camera we just reviewed in a recent episode, which means it's quite small. Yeah. Um, light, the, one of the reasons it's small is that the electronic viewfinder here on the left uh, does not protrude above the body, okay? So this is the electronic viewfinder here. And a lot of the people now are putting the electronic viewfinder in the middle, and that means it has to be up high to be up above the lens, and this camera keeps it down low and on the left, which is, you know, much more compact this way. Yeah, that's like the Panasonic, the the GX7 has it on the left, but on the on the Panasonic GX7, it's articulated, so you can kind of move it up and down. Is it, is right. it articulated on that body as well? No, no, this one doesn't articulate, it just sits there. Okay, okay. <laughs> it knows what it wants and it goes for it. It's like, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> cool. So what else is in there? It's got, what about the buttons and the, it's got a pop-up flash, I would assume, on that, on a little body like that, right? Yeah, yeah. What they did with this is interesting. Yeah, they put they pop the flash. They've had this for a while, so the you push the little button, the flash pops up, and you know it's what, like most of these small cameras. It's a decent fill flash when you're relatively close, but that's all you'd use it for, um, unless you're going to use it to trigger mainstream strobes. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of buttons on this camera, and they're almost all soft buttons, so you can really set it up the way you like. The controls are a little different than the NEX6. The NEX6 had this wheel. 
uh, underneath the the mode dial. The mode dial being you know program aperture, shutter, and so forth. Now they've moved it off to the side, so it's similar to what the NEX7 had. They called it TriNav. I think the NEX6 was a little better when it came to these knobs, but this is fine. The main thing is that everything here can be changed. So uh, I can use the wheel here. I can tip it left for uh, changing my release mode. I can go down below for exposure compensation. I can change my ISO by clicking on the right. I have a uh, the equivalent of a quick menu they call it just the function button push that once it goes into quick menu mode but of course you know the problem no touch screen. no touch Again. I, you know we're going to beat up on sony until they get this right now come on sony you know i just got a i'm i'm playing with a video camera from them one of their sort of mid-range consumer cameras that you know yeah. with floating lens element in there all of the cameras all of the video cameras and the handy cam and beyond uh, lineup that I've touched have touch. They all have touch. So what I'm proposing, Sony, if you're listening, is get your peanut butter from your video camera group and put it in the chocolate of your alpha group and give us touch screens on these bodies. I mean, why? I don't understand. I mean, what do you, what do you think it is? Why are they holding off on that? I, I don't know the reason. I don't know. There's got to be something. You know, coming up in a future show, we've got the the Panasonic Lumix GX4, and it's got all the bells and whistles that you and I love. So, anyway, I don't know. It's frustrating, but I got used to it. As I said, this is you know my camera. I've been using it a lot, and yeah. I adapt to it. It's it's a it is much better than the NEX cameras were in terms of menus, uh, in terms of this whole interface. So I consider it a step up, even though it's not as good as state of the art. Well, that that was good. That was going to be a question I was going to ask you because in several episodes of All About the Gear, you always rail against Sony and their. Uh, I think you at one point said maybe it was either you or Trey said the Sony's menuing system was designed by like monkeys on crack or something. <laughs> you know, is it? Is yeah. it is the menuing system in this thing any better than the previous iteration? This is much better than the NEX menus. Um, this is the same menuing system that you get in the A7, A7R, A7S cameras. And it's so much better that people who come from the world of the NEX stuff love it. Uh, it it's not as good, dang. let's say, as not as good as Olympus, not as good as Panasonic probably. But uh, it's so much better than it used to be. Yeah. Well, good. Good. I mean, that's a... Uh... I mean, that's half the battle right there. I mean, because especially if you don't have a touchscreen, you should at least have an easily to understand and intuitive, which means easy to understand, uh, menuing system to yeah. find the different functions in there. So speaking of different functions in there, um, one thing I know that you like to do is uh, like HDR from time to time and that kind of thing, which means bracketing. Does this thing do, does it have a good bracketing range and is it easy to get into those features? Yeah, the bracketing is pretty good on this. Not not as good maybe as uh, Panasonic in some cases, but it'll do three frames of bracketing mm -hmm. um, that can go up to as much as three stops between them. Uh, or you can go, for some reason, you can go to five frames and do two-thirds of a stop. Why you can only do two-thirds of a stop, I don't know. But three frames at one, two, or three stops between them is really pretty good. Um we're going to introduce we're going to introduce a whole new thing here. This was suggested actually by one of our viewers. Mm. I gave it a name. I called I'm going to call this Uncle Doug's Exposure Triangle Test. Uh -oh. now, since we're introducing this, I better explain it. The idea is that with any camera, you ought to be able to get to the things that alter the exposure triangle. We all learn that that's uh, adjusting shutter speed, um, aperture. Uh, and ISO, and that if you change one, you change the others to balance for it. And that's why they call it a triangle. Well, there's actually there's a this is a four corner triangle because we're also uh, including exposure compensation. So if a camera had dedicated controls for all four of those things, it would earn 12 points, mm -hmm. four times four. And if a camera required you to go into the menu system to adjust every one of those things, it would get a zero. Mm. So if you have dedicated and labeled controls, you get um, uh, uh, three points. I'm sorry, not four, three points. If they're soft buttons, you get two. If you have to click, uh, you get one and so forth. So this camera, the first one to be rated by Uncle Doug's exposure triangle test, gets six out of 12. 
Oh. And a 6 out of 12 is pretty good for a small camera. What that means is everything is reasonably accessible. Um, shutter speed and aperture I can get to very quickly. ISO and exposure compensation, I have to click, dial, and click. So it's, you know, that, that's important, I think, to, to any person who's going beyond shooting automatic. Anybody who's moving to aperture priority, shutter priority, towards even manual, that's what they're looking for. Yeah, because you got to be able to get to those controls fast and intuitively so that you can, you know, realize the shot that you have in your mind's eye, right? That's right. So the first camera to be rated, the Sony Alpha 6000, gets a 6 out of 12. We'll, we'll see what kind of bench, we'll see what benchmark that sets for, sets for future reviews. I love it. Uncle Doug's exposure triangle test. Yep. Nice. All right. My long lost uncle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's talk about the sensor and the shutter. Of course, you know, this is this is the critical guts of the camera. If it fails here, then, you know, it's all for naught. What was your experience with this puppy? It's pretty good. The um, The shutter goes up to a four thousandth of a second, which is pretty common at this price range you get only six hundred dollars for the camera the high end is only one stop more one eight thousandths of a second this doesn't go quite there mm -hmm. the sensor 24 megapixels as we said but they're starting to do something interesting now and that is in the corners of the sensors these photo sites are being tilted they're slightly angled in in order to pick up more light from the wide angle lenses so it used to be that it was very difficult to put wide angle lenses particularly on these mirrorless cameras where the lenses are so far deep into the body uh, because the distance from the flange to the sensor is so short yeah. and so uh, now what they're doing I'll just show you you can't really see it when you look at it but of course there's your sensor in the camera right there there's no mirror mm -hmm. and the corners are actually slightly angled in. All the little photo sites, that 24 million of them, the ones in the corners are slightly tipped in uh, in order to be able to get more light from the wide-angle lenses. That's so that's a that's a change. And we expect to see that now on a lot of the future uh, sensors from Sony as well. And, of course, Sony makes sensors for almost everybody else. Right, right. Yeah, those engineers, man, they're they're brilliant. They can, they're learning to squeeze light out of a rock. <laughs> Yeah, now, this is pretty good at medium ISO. So, uh, you know, I was pretty comfortable shooting at ISO 800. I was in New York recently for a week, and I shot at, uh, specifically on purpose, at 1600 and 3200. Mm -hmm. Pretty good at 16, starting to crap out at 32. Uh, real nice up to about 800. So, again, not there at the, you know, real high ISO end, but not bad in the middle range. Yeah, if you need those ultra high ISOs, you're going to want to move to something like a A7S, right? Because the S stands for sensitivity, and that thing can it can suck light out of a black hole, right? I mean, it's like the the uh, what what was it? Ten thousand four hundred nine thousand six hundred four hundred and nine thousand six hundred ISO. That's mm -hmm. That's insane. That's just insane. All right. So you had one negative in here about that sensor shutter or something about the shots taking a while to write. Well, what was the deal there? Yeah, that was that was one of the problems I had. Let me uh, let me go take a look at this. I'll just show you because it's it's an easy thing to demonstrate if I can figure out how. Um, go in here. We'll go to continuous shooting mode, and we'll fire off a bunch of shots. You should be able to hear this. Yep. Okay. Great. Now I want to play them back, and it says. Writing to, what did it say? I'll do it again. Writing to memory card, unable to operate. So the problem is, if you fire off brackets, bracketed exposures or continuous exposures, which you're likely to do with this camera, um, you can keep shooting for a while, but you can't play back your images on the screen or the viewfinder until the last one is written to the card. And that's something that... The higher-end Sony's like the A7 don't do this way, but this camera is slower in that sense. It was the, it's the only thing that frustrated me shooting for a week in the streets of New York. Yeah, interesting, huh? I've never seen that. But what about the uh, what about the EVF? So the electronic, yeah. electronic yeah, viewfinder, LCD, all that stuff, top notch. Uh, it, good enough. Sony did some strange things here. They 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 from the NEX6 they went to a lower res uh, EVF. And you might think that that's a step down, but the fact is that it's still nice and bright, nice and contrasty. The lag is not too bad. Um, so the EVS is fine. It's got a lot of data. I 
uh, you know, if I hadn't studied it, I wouldn't know that it was actually a lower resolution. Yeah. The LCD is good. Um, I turn the brightness up all the way, almost in every case except when I'm indoors at night because it needs it. It just isn't that bright. And of course, that makes the batteries run down that much more quickly. Yeah. Um, the big problem with all of these mirrorless Sonys is this challenge of how easy, how too easy it is to shift from the LCD to the EVF. So you bring your body in like this, right? And you see it switches, oh. right? So again, here's here's my my uh, my chest is coming in, and when my chest gets there, it switches. Way too sensitive. If I hold the camera up against my body because I'm looking down into the viewfinder, it switches to the EVF, which means I either have to pull it away from my body, or manually turn off the EVF. So you, uh, can, you, can you dial down the sensitivity on the EVF? No, not oh. on that switch. No, oh, you cannot. Okay. And that's something that that. Uh, our friend Gordon Lang over at Camera Labs, who, as you know, does in you know detailed. Re Gordon's reviews are so long that it's almost hard to get through. <laughs> but they're, 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 yeah, he they're writes so e-books. Cool <laughs> but he writes you know, e-books that are masquerading as blog posts. Yeah, he pointed out that uh, this camera really could do with a sensitivity control for that that sensor that picks up the proximity of your your face or your eye or your your chest. Yeah, yeah, I had that problem on the GH3. And the GX7 on the Lumix, you know, Panasonic. And but luckily, there's a sensitivity setting in there, which I dialed all the way down, and it still bugged me uh, because I don't know, maybe the way I was holding the camera. So I just ended up turning it off and just I I set one of the buttons on the back of the camera so I can toggle it manually when I want the EVF to be on or the back LCD to be on. So I am I am the switch now. Yeah, I mean, it, I like having it switch automatically, and you adapt to it. You develop some strange habits that people will just call, say that you develop ticks <laughs> as you you start to move in strange ways. <laughs> um, you know, like you know, you hold the camera and then you move it around. Just you're, you're jiggling it just to get the LCD to come back on. But anyway, not not too bad. But it's the that and the uh, delays right into the card are two of the annoying things about the camera. What about the focusing of the camera? That's the other thing we talk about a lot. The focus speed. What was the last camera we talked about that said it had the world's fastest autofocus? We did the uh, Fujifilm X-T1, which claimed to have the fastest. And, of course, that camera was out before this camera, so mm -hmm. they get away with it. Um, this camera also claims to have the world's fastest autofocus. Uh, it is really, really good. And I want to tell you the specific use case where it's good. Uh, and that is continuous autofocus. So there, think about this. You've got focus acquisition, which is either to get the one frame you want to shoot or the first frame of a sequence. Mm -hmm. And that, in these cameras, typically uses contrast detection, meaning they just use, like, live view to do it, yeah. equivalent of live view from a, a DSLR. Once they've locked on, they switch to a hybrid mode where they use these little phase detect points that are embedded in the sensor and contrast combined in order to track the object once they found it. This camera is the best continuous autofocus that I've used of any mirrorless camera. And, uh, and that's why... A lot of mirrorless I, cameras, so that's quite a statement. Yeah, it's really nice. It, I loved it in New York when I was shooting people on the street. Sometimes I just stand there on Broadway and people would just walk straight towards me. And once I acquired autofocus, they could just keep walking at normal speed. I could zoom in close, and it would just go snap, 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 and keep getting them. Wow. Um, I shot you know, children running in a park. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't gone out and short, shot sports with it, but I am confident that this is one of the first mirrorless cameras that you can really shoot sports with. Interesting. Um, and uh, I look forward to I'm – go, I'm going to a local AAA baseball game later this week, and I'm going to give it a shot. Cool. All right. And what about the face detection on there? So it was good good tracking, like the people yeah, in New York that were walking towards you? Face detection, as I mentioned in that X-T1 review, um, is something I've gotten to like quite a bit. Um, it works really well. It finds faces. In this camera, you can actually register specific faces. So let's say, you know, you wanted to make sure that your wife was always in focus, but, you know, her mother wasn't, um, you could register your wife's face and, uh, and it would give more priority to that. Yeah. Uh, I've never actually tried that, but the, the generic face detection works pretty I can, well. I can understand where that would come in handy, especially if, you know, your kid's birthday party or something and, you know, you want to make sure that your kid has priority in terms of focus over 
the other parents' kids, or you're shooting a wedding and you want to give priority to the bride and the groom or, you know, some other VIPs at the wedding and, and less priority at everyone else, I can see how that would, you know, pop in. Yeah. That's you know it's a cool feature. I like it. I can see. I can see. Ask me. Excuse me. May I get your picture so I can register your face in my camera? It's an interesting concept. Exactly. Yeah, that could end badly. Um, cool. So autofocus is good. Here's the big question, though. You know, I was going to ask this because I've been moving into motion and video a lot. How is this thing for recording video? I'm assuming it's 1080, right? It is 1080. Uh, and it'll go up to 50 or 60 frames per second. Okay. Uh, it puts out a pretty good stream of data, 28 megabit per second stream, which is you know pretty decent resolution. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was really pretty good. Now, it's it fails on a couple of tests that we always like. We're looking for the external mic jack, and this guy just doesn't have the room for it. So they've got, uh, on the edge here, they've only got... Uh, an HDMI output and a USB connector, which Sony uses for a variety of things, including their remote. So there's no mic jack. You have to put something here into the hot shoe uh, in order to get an external mic jack. So More you know, pieces in your camera bag of stuff to carry it, and 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 lose and forget. That's happened, yeah. hasn't it? Yeah. And, uh, and malfunction. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But the fact is that it's a good camera for a couple of reasons, and that is that unlike, I think it was the one of the cameras we just did, they all blur together for me, but uh, there's some cameras where you can't control things. Not only can you control the aperture, the shutter speed of the frames, the ISO, on this camera you can actually change them on the fly. You don't have to stop the camera in the middle of a video shoot if That's you wanted cool. to adjust them. Wow. What, um, about, and that, what about manual focus while you're shooting? Can you, can you still focus? Yep, you can. You have uh, focus peaking, so you can actually focus with focus peaking while you're in shooting mode. Uh, you can put it in autofocus. It has a, again, the, the continuous autofocus is so good in this camera, and they have control that you can set for how sticky the uh, tracking is. So let's say, um, you know, you're doing continuous autofocus, and then somebody walks into the foreground. How quickly does the camera give up on what you told it to follow and instead switch to the foreground? And you have ways to adjust the sensitivity of that as well as the time delay. Um, so it's pretty nice for you know using in that autofocus mode as opposed to a manual focus mode as well. Very cool. Awesome. All right. Well, you know, that's one of those things that I keep hammering on. I'm, I'm not going to let up on that mic jack or that touchscreen. So, <laughs> so the other things that I keep, I keep hammering on is Wi-Fi. Right, yep. and being able to to handle that Wi-Fi, being able to trigger the camera remotely from a, a tablet or a phone, or uh, offload images from the camera to your device for editing and uploading to social media. How does this one fare in the in that regard? This is a standard Sony these days, which means that you have. Uh, Wi-Fi, you have NFC to make it easier to connect to Android devices. Uh, they, Sony's the only manufacturer that has apps that download into the camera, and that's good news and bad news. They have this whole universe called Play Memories, and the apps are called Play, Mem Play Memories apps, and I think you go to some website like playmemories.com. It's nice to be able to buy apps that cost a couple of dollars and install them in your camera like you would in your smartphone, on the other hand, a lot of the apps are making up for deficiencies in the camera. So the camera doesn't have a built-in intervalometer for doing time lapse, uh, but you can buy a uh, an app to do that. Oh, um, yeah. So you know, uh, and you know, nobody's going to be uh, too upset about spending a couple of dollars. But it it works, and you can do that. Um, one of the things that I we we didn't mention that's also on Frederick's pet list is the uh, tiltable tiltable screen. Uh -oh. This this LCD, like most of the Sony mirrorless, I think all, well, almost all, you had the five, which is a little better, I think. Yeah. But yeah. this one will tilt up. It will tilt down 45 degrees. It will not swivel out. Won't all right. So and it won't tilt and face forward up like the five, the NEX 5R um, and the 5N. I'm not sure if, I'm sure that's discontinued too, but it would flip all the way forward into what Sony called a selfie mode. So that as you're facing the camera, you'd see the image right above the lens there. So this one doesn't yeah. do that, right? I've got I've got a sneak preview of another camera here. Ooh, what's that? Top secret. But this is uh, here's one that does exactly what you're saying, which is you can bring it out, you can flip it around. Yes. 
you can make it go selfie mode. I'll yeah. cover up what that is. Do I have that little? Oh, there you go. No, here it is. Look at this. This is what I'm talking about. So this is this is the. I know I have a giant lens. Pay no attention to that. <laughs> so this is the 5R, right? So on the back, when you flip up the LCD, it'll do this, Doug. Look at that. See? Yeah, very nice. It'll flip, it'll flip and face forward and, of course, invert the image. And then it'll do all the little art, articulation sideways so you can shoot from the bottom and all that. But you can shoot. I like that because now you can, you as you're shooting yourself or doing video of yourself, you can preview the image right there. So I love that. That's a really cool design, I think. Right. So, you know, in these ergonomic areas, the, the manufacturers are slowly getting better and better. Sony came out with that, you know, that NEX5 quite a while ago, but they've not adapted that to these more recent cameras. Hmm. I don't know why. We could beat up on them forever. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about the lenses. People yeah. complain about Sony's E-mount lenses, but it's important to separate them into two categories. Yeah. For these APS-C, the small sensor crop sensor cameras, the lenses, lens collection is now at this point pretty good. Um, when I shot in New York, for example, I just took this, let me show you here, this is an 18 to 200 uh, variable aperture zoom. Mm -hmm. So this is F, um, what is it, 3.5 to 6.3. Okay. And this was my walk around lens for all over New York City. And it was fine, I loved it, it was just perfect. Couldn't shoot in low light with it, whatever, but it was great. I want to show you by comparison, this is the equivalent lens on a full frame camera. This is a 28 to 300 for Nikon. Um, and the one on the left, the Nikon, um, weighs quite a bit more. As you can see, it's quite a bit larger. It's yeah. the same equivalent field of view. So 28 to 300 millimeters on a full frame camera looks through the viewfinder as the same size image as an 18 to 200 on a smaller uh, sensor. And um, so I was, I'm happy with the lens collection on this part of the Sony line. When you go to the full frame cameras, the lens selection is uh, not as good. Right, yeah, they've, I've seen a roadmap. They've, they say they have some really cool lenses coming out, but you know, like, like any other technology, when you dance on the bleeding edge, you have to make sacrifices, right? And one of those sacrifices is lack of lens inventory while Sony, you know, puts the puts the glass through its paces. Yeah. I mean, one of the things about this lens is interesting. As much as I love it, I use this with my other cameras, but it costs $150 more than the camera. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's, this shows you what value the camera is, but you will spend $750 to get this lens. That's right. Glass, 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 and the bodies come and go. What about the uh, the competition for this, Doug? Put it put it in perspective of the world of peers for this particular camera. Who's it going against? Yeah, it's a challenge to know where it is because you can either be, the problem is that the camera is a really good value. You're getting a lot of camera for six hundred dollars. So the question is, do you compare it to other cameras in the price range? In which case, it mostly blows them away. Or do you compare it to cameras of a similar quality, in which case it's just very inexpensive? Mm -hmm. And as, as you said, people are going to be spending more for lenses than they are for bodies over a period of time, no matter what. Yeah. Oh, one that we looked at was the Olympus OMD EM10, which is a smaller sensor, micro four-thirds, 16 megapixel, exactly the same street price, $700. Mm -hmm. um, the OMD EM10 has... Uh, Two big advantages. Well, let's say three. The biggest ones are image stabilization. We all love Olympus's image stabilization. Magic, yeah. And the incredible array of lenses that you can get from Micro Four Thirds cameras. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it has a touch screen. I was um, say that. Not but... not the best touch screen, but hey, any touch screen is better than no touch screen at all. Yeah. So, the OMD EM10 is a camera I would recommend, obviously for people who prefer Micro Four Thirds but also for people who need the image stabilization and a wide variety of lenses. Okay. okay. Now, who's the, other, who's the other guy? Yeah, the other thing we could compare it to might be, there, there's really not much else to compare it to in the micro four, and sorry, in the mirrorless world. Um, it sort of blows away almost everything else unless you got up above $1,000. Mm -hmm. So if we go to the DSLR market, the clearest competitor there is probably the Nikon D5300, a relatively new camera. It costs just a little more, $750 for the body. Um, 
this camera has a built-in GPS, which is something that, that very few cameras have, but yeah. I really would like to see. Yeah. It has a full swiveling LCD, uh, like we just looked at on the uh, Lumix I was showing you. Yeah. Um, why would you go to the Nikon? Well, you would go to the Nikon, A, if you're already in the Nikon world, B, you want to be in the Nikon world, or if you're particularly attracted to optical viewfinders. If you'd rather have optical than electronic viewfinders, then, of course, go with the DSLRs, because that's what you'll find there. But, um, you know, certainly between these three cameras, the EM10, the 5300, and this, this is far and away my favorite of the three. So I think it's a very strong competitor in this low-end market. And I'll tell you, you know, I have cameras here that cost over $4,000, and this camera is the one that goes out the door with me more than anything else. Yeah, which means it's the best camera because it's the one you have with you. Th that's right, it. Right. Doug, let's close this off. So in a nutshell, who is this camera for? Who's the, who's the target audience? Is it, you know, is it is it an addition to my big camera kit that has all my other stuff in it? Or could this be my primary camera that I take with me? Good, good questions, and I would say yes to both of them. If you're... If you're into the Sony uh, universe or want to be, great camera. This could be the second camera. If you have anything else that's E-mount, this could be that camera that you give to your traveling companion uh, that's your backup but their primary camera. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we call it the, uh, the backup slash spouse body. Uh, um, but it is a great way to get also into general photography of things that move. This is for shooting kids, for sports, for action, and it is a great camera for street photography. So um, this is a real nice general purpose ca camera. I think a lot of people are going to go for something like this and not buy anything else. This is a camera that does almost everything except when you go to those real low light situations even then it's not bad you could put some fast glass you know you can get f18 and maybe even f14 lenses for this thing so yeah. um it sort of defines having a singular role it covers a lot of ground very cool all right so sounds like a good camera right and what top line again this camera is 600 bucks 600 dollars for the body oh don't get the power zoom. The, the, for $150, you can get the kit zoom. It's a, uh, I forget what it is, 14 to 50 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, probably a little off. But it's it's one of these power zoom lenses where you can only zoom by pushing the button. You can't just crank a ring and move it. Okay. It's design, Those things are designed for video where you want the smooth zooming. But, you know, as a still camera, I find it very frustrating to use them. I would rather see you look at one of the other Sony kit lens options or, you know, what you'd have to do is buy the body and add a lens. But yeah. that's that's what I recommend. All right. Well, cool. Very thorough review, Mr. K, you know, and congratulations on your new purchase. Thank you. Add it to What's the collection of toys. I know. I know. you. It's not a collection over there. I'm getting to see that it's more like... Uh, it's kind of like the conveyor belt, the tectonic plate conveyor belt. You know, things are just sort of moving around over there, and some go away, and others show up. And you sell something, you get something new. It's kind of cool. I like it. I have to. I'm gonna have to adopt that methodology. What's coming up next? What are the uh, this, the cameras that you have on your radar? I I thought you'd never ask. Uh, I've just been making a picture of them here. Here we have. Uh, the one we just reviewed here on the right. This is the Sony. Looks a little funny at this angle, but that's the Sony. Uh, A6000 we just did, and right yeah. here to its left is the Panasonic Lumix GH, GH4. Oh, and uh, this just walked in yesterday, and we're starting to put it through its paces. It's a hefty camera. It's, it, it looks like a DSLR, even though it's a mirrorless. But the big thing about this camera is that it shoots 4K video. It shoots 4K. And I'll tell you that one of the main things, other than... You know, it's it's the I think it's the evolution of the GH3. Although you know they're still selling the GH3 and the GH4 in tandem, um, but one big thing aside from refinements and speed and better sensor and all that, focus peaking. That that thing has focus peaking on it, whereas the GH3 does not have focus. It it does indeed have focus peaking and a nice fully articulating screen as we looked at. Yep. Um, and my initial. Look at it. It's a uh, quite an impressive camera. All right, cool. Well, we'll have to. I can't wait to hear what your final thoughts are on the new Panasonic GH3. And then we've got two more. Two more Sony's coming in. We have two the more Sony's. A, what else is coming? A7S. That's the one we mentioned at ISO four hundred nine thousand six hundred. Yes. And 
Then the cute little, I think we already did a show on the RX100 or the Mark II. Now we've got the RX100 Mark III. It's a, a point and shoot that has a pop up uh, electronic viewfinder. And I'm looking forward to seeing that one. Yes, yes. Very cool. Very cool. You got a lot of work ahead of you, man. <laughs> Life is hard. Life is hard. Poor Doug. You, you, know what this is? <laughs> you know what that is? That's the world's smallest violin playing for you. <laughs> uh, I just wish so, I could keep. I wish I could keep more of these. You know, most of these have to go back somewhere, but um, yeah, I can't complain. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Doug. This has uh, been another educational episode of All About the Gear, and I'll see you in the next episode. See you for the next one. Thanks, Frederick. Bye-bye.